Thank you, Sherry, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Interpreting Ramel 3 Performance, presented by Dr. Adams and Dr. Sheslow. Um, as she mentioned, I am Ben Clares, the Pearson Product Manager for Ramel 3. And before the authors begin the workshop, I'm going to run through a few items. <clears throat> First off, as mentioned, the two interpretive reports for the case studies that will be discussed here today can be found linked in the chat box. If you are reviewing the recording, the reports can be found under the resources tab on the Ramel 3 Pearson clinical site. If you do have any questions for the authors, um, you can please use the Q&A box at the bottom and it is being monitored by myself as well as the others that were mentioned earlier. For the structure of this presentation, I will start off with a quick high level overview of the interpretive report layout and then we'll pass it over to the authors who will go through their first case. We'll then take a brief pause to answer any questions about the first case before moving on to the second one. Any remaining time after the second case will be devoted to questions. Also, a quick disclaimer. Dr. Adams and Dr. Sheslow are co-authors of the RAML 2 and RAML 3, and as such, they receive royalties on the sales of test materials and scorings from Pearson's. Now, for those who haven't had a chance, to see an interpretive report for the RAML 3 yet, I will be going over the overall structure quick before the authors do a deeper dive into their two cases. There's no need right now to try and read all the small numbers and text on these next few slides as this is just an overview. This first slide here shows the first four or five pages, which is full of index, subtest, and discrepancy tables that are also found on the standard form score report and the first five pages of the paper record form. As we can see, this is a lot of information and has the potential to be a bit overwhelming. We're hoping by the end of this presentation that you'll be able to better understand where to start and some of the more important aspects to view first. The authors had an overarching goal of this interpretive report for it to be a helpful tool that allows you to generate active hypotheses about the examinee. Once we get past more of the subtest and index tables, we get into what makes the IR different from a standard report, and that's the interpretation and narrative sections. This will have a structure that repeats itself throughout the immediate, delayed recall, and recognition, recognition sections. Excuse me. Each section will have two paragraphs that describe the index or subtest, the score attained, interpretation of how it might affect the examinee in daily life, and if there are any other scores to review to help with this interpretation. The entire report follows a top-down approach. It starts with the overall general immediate memory index, then dives down into visual immediate memory index, followed by its two subtests, picture memory and design learning, along with their associated process scores. This is followed up by verbal learning immediate index with its two subtests, story memory and verbal learning, and then the immediate section finishes off with finger windows, number letter, and sentence memory. For those wondering, the working memory section comes after the recognition. As you can see in the couple snippets here, the process score tables have been broken out from the other tables and will be located near their associated paragraphs so it isn't just all tables at the beginning and then all text throughout. After the immediate comes the delayed recall memory index with its indexes and subtest nested under that, along with the comparisons between delayed and immediate memory. The authors wanted to emphasize the delayed recall more in RAML 3 than on previous versions, which they'll discuss later. Following that is the recognition indexes and subtests, and then the working memory index and its two subtests at the end. Oops. Finally, at the very end, we have interpretations of all the discrepancy analyses and a dynamic table that will list off all the important reported findings. This is basically a table that will show any comparisons from the indexes and subtests or immediate delayed recognition comparisons that trigger a 15% or lower base rate. This is a nice quick reference that is a new feature not seen on other interpretive reports. So that was a lot of information I went over pretty quickly but I wanted to give just a general overview of the structure. As mentioned, you can review this in the two example case studies that have been linked in the chat. I would also like to mention for those looking for training on how to administer and score the RAML 3, an independent study training program with available CE credits 
that can be reviewed for an extended period of time will be offered around mid-April. So please keep an eye out for that. And now I'll stop sharing so Dr. Adams and Dr. Sheslow can take over to present their cases. I'll be back shortly after the first case to ask any of the questions you may have. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you. So good morning and good afternoon, depending on the time zone you're in. Thanks for joining us today. And I hope that this will be a, a good uh, presentation to help people feel more comfortable uh, walking through and really exploiting some of the new features with the RAML 3. Uh, before I get going here, um, I want to draw attention to um, maybe the question that probably a lot of people would ask, you know, why do we need to look at memory assessment um, when we have so many other things to, to look at? And so I, I want to just start with this uh, one uh, bar graph that I think answers that quite well. These are, these are results from a, a dissertation that uh, one of my students and I, I did quite a while ago. It's based on the RAML 2, but given the similarities of the two and the, the RAML 3, uh, I am assuming that the results would be comparable, although if there are folks out there who have access to these particular clinical populations, I would be very uh, interested in collaborating with you to try to replicate this uh, result. Uh, so from RAML2, the bar graphs that you're looking at there, we have uh, four clinical or three clinical groups and, and a matched control group. And the yellow bars are for uh, youngsters with ADHD and the green bar, those with reading disability of one form or another. The red bar are those who have comorbidities of both ADHD and reading disorder. And then the white bar uh, is a match control from a standardization sample. And just real quickly, uh, you'll see the indexes at the bottom and the scaled scores there in the ordinate uh, on the left side. And what I wanna point out here is if you look at uh, youngsters who have ADHD, you know, by and large, those yellow bars, yeah, there are differences um, in the one area you'd expect, attention concentration. But by and large, uh, most ADHD youngsters uh, are pretty close to resembling the non-clinical population. But with youngsters with reading disorder, it's pretty uniform. You know, that green bar is um, between a third and almost uh, two thirds of a standard deviation below average. And when you get to the reading disorder ADHD subgroup, which is about half the kids who have ADHD, you have, uh, in many cases, a standard deviation or more below average in memory capacity. And now these are immediate memory and um, this, this needs to be replicated with delay memory and recognition as well. But the recognition from RAML2 does suggest that that tendency exists, although the recognition is a little more sophisticated with RAML3, but I'm assuming the results would, would, would be very similar. So this uh, graph, I think, dramatizes the importance of memory disability in um, two very commonly referred subgroups of children, namely those with reading disorder and reading disorder with attention deficit. And one could make a reasonable argument that these are children who have memory deficits. I mean, that's not a legitimate um, disability. It's not in DSM four or five. I mean, it's just, it's just not recognized. But uh, this, I think, does show that youngsters who come to us, and obviously adults as well, do have disabilities in memory areas and identifying those is very important to understand some of the struggles that our clients are experiencing. So having said that, let's move on to our first case uh, study. And we're doing these case studies really to demonstrate kind of at least two things. One is how the uh, interpretive report can be used. And second of all, some of the um, and we like to think our improvements or at least changes in RAML uh, 3 over RAML 2. And this is a, a case of the uh, eight-year, five-month-old uh, male. 
And just reading from the slide, uh, the parents requested evaluation of this youngster because of concerns expressed by teachers about inattention. Pretty common referral question. Uh, such concerns were noted since first grade, but increased in second grade along with a lack of progress in reading. The child is relatively quiet, so the teacher says, but acts out and becomes, the acting out has become more frequent, especially when completing homework. And the, the parents that are reporting at home it, it are a number of outbursts. So if we were assuming we've given the Ramble 3 to this youngster, let me just uh, walk through this. And Dave, my co-author, will chime in here from time to time as well. Just walk through, and I'm going to talk out loud just uh, as I'm going through the first part of the interpretive report, which is just full of a bunch of tables, looking at the kinds of things that I would think about in looking at this particular case. And so the first thing that you find at the top of the report is a performance validity indicator, which is a new feature for RAML 3. And it says acceptable. And just as a quick review for those who this may be a new feature. Uh, the performance validity indicator is made up really of two components. One is the attention concentration index being below uh, or at or below 70, uh, and the recognition items uh, being below 16 or below. Uh, the ACI is pretty obvious. The recognition ones are actually were created by taking the first uh, four, uh, five items of each of the recognition subtests. And these first five items actually were pulled from the total recognition items as the simplest items for a given recognition subtest. So these are very simple items which should be passed by the vast majority of people and even uh, folks with um, intellectual delay or um, early stages of dementia do reasonably well uh, with those recognition items by and large. So those are the two indicators. And with those two at play, we have a, an acceptable performance indicator suggesting that this youngster is giving reasonable effort uh, in the performance and the scores are likely believable from an, an effort perspective. So let's just wander through top down as Ben was talking about the index scores first and the immediate ones, these are the so-called, what used to be called core subtests. These are immediate memory. And certainly the first impressions you get here, you have 115 and 88, which is a pretty big spread. And if we check the discrepancy uh, table, which I'll not bring up here just for the interest of time, you'll see that that in fact is uh, significant. It's uh, statistically, but also it is a relatively rare event. It happens in fewer than 5% of the, of the uh, uh, standardization group. So this would suggest that visual memory capability is notably better than verbal and intention concentration is low average or near the low average range, but still grossly within the average range. Um, so quite a bit of spread making general immediate memory probably not a really good estimate of immediate memory because of this discrepancy uh, in those things that contribute to that score. So let's, we're gonna skip screener. Dave will talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute, um, or several minutes. Uh, we have visual and verbal delay, which actually traces what we found with immediate. Namely, the visual is notably better and the verbal is notably weaker. And that again, discrepancy tables show that that happens in two or fewer percent of the population of the standardization. Wait, does, this, does this make you uh, wonder if we're talking about more than ADHD as you're starting to screen these data? Well, certainly that is a hypothesis that's raised. I mean, we, what we saw from that uh, initial uh, bar graph table, um, there 
usually you're not finding this kind of discrepancy with ADHD youngsters. So certainly there is the suggestion that something else is at play here and um, probably will need to be looked at either with other materials that test materials that have been used or as we'll see in this illustration uh, within RAML, there are some hints of what else may be at play. But yeah, thanks, Dave. Now, we move on down here to the recognition and kind of a surprising event here. We find uh, an unexpected development here that visual recognition and verbal recognition actually are comparable and above average. And that's a different story than what we're finding with immediate or delayed. So now we have to ask ourselves, well, what phenomenon would allow recognition which is suggesting the information is stored up there, but that's not what we're being told by the scores with immediate or delayed. And certainly one of the suggestions here is that the information is there, but for whatever reason, particularly with verbal information, that is not easily accessible, cannot easily be retrieved on demand by this youngster. And we'll, we'll return to that. But that's an initial hypothesis that we'll want to look at as we look at both subtest level and process level scores. Um, speaking of which, uh, let, let's see what, whether we're finding a consistent picture of those hypotheses being suggested by index scores. And so the subtests here, the visuals are presented here in this first column, pretty consistent. Verbal, pretty consistent, and in what we'd expect from the index scores, relative weaknesses with verbal immediate memory. Attention concentration, though, is not consistent. And if we looked at discrepancy tables, here again, we'd find that to be a relatively rare event, that, uh, that five point difference between finger windows and number letter. Here again, though, it's suggesting that the visual processing of short-term memory is certainly significantly better than the non-visual, uh, the, the more auditory number letter. Um, this is relatively free of linguistic content which would certainly be a hypothesis one would use to explain these low scores with story memory and verbal learning. So we'll kind of keep that in the back of our minds as we look at these other findings. I, I wonder, Wayne, as you're looking at the number letter, one of the things that I might wonder about is number letter subtest requires sequencing, putting, putting non-linguistic material in the right order. And if I'm beginning to wonder, is there going to be a learning disability uh, or even a language-based learning disability if that kind of, of symbolic processing or sequential processing is now showing us a hint? Certainly that would be a reasonable hypothesis. And if you actually look at the, some of the tables in the technical manual, you'll see that number letter is actually one of the uh, highest correlates with academic achievement in elementary school. So it, it's certainly the idea of manipulating symbols and doing it in the right sequence seems to play an important role in academic pursuits and maybe is one of the things, uh, a reason why this youngster is struggling with reading, which is a highly sequential and symbolic task. Yeah. The other thing that you might want to think about here with number letter is, is there a hearing problem? Because telling the difference between some of those consonants that are involved in number letter sometimes can be tricky for a person with uh, lowered hearing uh, acuity. And in that case, uh, you would probably expect hints of that elsewhere. Uh, and we're not seeing that, for example, with verbal learning, uh, which is up here and requires um, a reasonable amount of hearing demand. And that score is a little bit better than story, but it's something to keep in the back of our mind uh, as we look through other results. Uh, here we have the delayed subtests. And um, again, the same theme, relatively strength, relative strength in visual short-term memory, or in this case, it's a longer term memory. And we have um, relative weaknesses in um, longer term verbal memory. 
So the, the impairment uh, between visual and verbal, um, um, we might think encoding or acquisition, but the recognition suggests that that is not where the problem is uh, with the verbal, but seems to be more in retrieval. So here we have the recognition scores, and as we've seen already, they are relative strengths uh, across the board, uh, and uh, we don't see that weakness with the verbal uh, information. And uh, so whatever conclusion we come up with, we'll have to take that into account, and retrieval is a, is a main one that I'm thinking of, at least at this point. Uh, the working memory, which we didn't mention, uh, most people are aware that working memory uh, has generous amounts of short-term memory as well as executive function. And given uh, this youngster's uh, relative strengths in visual, uh, it's not too surprising that we have a 13 in visual working memory, but it also gives us another reason for some optimism in thinking about recommendations because here's a person who probably is not just good with short-term visual memory, but probably has reasonable executive function to use that short-term visual memory. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that uh, in, in, as we drill down with some of the process scores as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sentence memory, let's just maybe make one, one comment about sentence memory. Um, before we move on. Sentence memory is a test that's uh, withstood the test of time. It was on the original RAML, it was on RAML 2, and here it is on RAML 3. It's a relatively fast test to give, and it was retained primarily because it is a, a great subtest to use in comparison with other language uh, and auditory demands of uh, the RAML. So what I often do is look at results from story memory and results from sentence memory and results from the number letter. Uh, they're all auditory and tasks that have declining amounts of language demand. So here, stories obviously greatly demanding narrative that is both expressive and receptive language skills, where a sentence is much less and a number letter almost none. Uh, and so here we have uh, a suggestion that the sentence memory is uh, not a whole lot worse, actually, than story. So at least um, there's something more than language going on here, possibly. Um, and, uh, and in fact, Wayne, I wonder if the, the scoring of sentence memory, if you make one minor error, you lose a point. If you make two minor errors, you, you, end, up you end up losing for the entire item. So yeah. the referral yeah. question of ADHD, uh, any inattention may also be one of those contributing factors that you were discussing. Yes, and uh, that might be a, well, we could actually go back and look at sentence memory, the performance, see whether that's what's happening. Uh, we, we have a hint, letting a little bit of the cat out of the bag here, uh, that that in fact is going on when we look at the verbatim gist analyses with this youngster as we look at the process scores for story memory. Uh, the verbatim is relatively poor, whereas the gist is almost average. So uh, attention, the ability to retain uh, specific details, particularly in verbatim information, um, is a re relative weakness for this youngster. Um, I want to also uh, point out another use I make of sentence memory, which uh, most teachers that I've worked with really appreciate. Um, with this youngster, we have a raw score of 13. And if we look at the uh, actual subtest, that means, relatively speaking, that this is a, a youngster who is getting about the first seven items, two points per item, and then things start falling apart. What I usually do, for example, the seventh item happens to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. And once you get to eight words or more, the system really starts to fall apart. And that makes for, I think, a pretty handy recommendation that teachers should consider when giving directions to a client or in a, as a tutor trying to explain something using, in this case, a relative area of weakness, verbal, uh, to try to keep sentences seven words or fewer 
uh, in order for this youngster to be able to process with reasonable efficiency from at least the memory perspective. Um, and that sometimes is a very useful um, a piece of advice for parents, teachers, as, and tutors. Uh, we also added uh, on the uh, interpretive report, and as well as you can do this manually uh, on the record form, but we've uh, congregated, if you will, families uh, of subtests. So we have the picture memory, picture delayed, and picture recognition all together, and likewise, all the story subtests together, design subtests. So it becomes relatively easy to do a a, a scan down here. These are all pictures. They're all within average range. Very different. We have stories that come down and here's that surprising recognition result. Uh, the family of design learning uh, looks uh, pretty good again with that recognition result um, and so forth. So it's, it allows kind of at, at a quick glance um, to see how performance is immediate and delayed and recognition for a given subtest family. And a similar kind of thing over here with index scores uh, at a glance. So we've gone through indexes, we've gone through subtests, and now we're going to drill down to some of the process scores, which help us understand, in some cases, how to interpret uh, unusual events or, or trends that we found in the subtests or in the indices. So uh, first thing, commission errors. Remember, uh, if I just go back here, this is, a, this is one of the highest scores that the youngster achieved. Um, we may not be quite so impressed when we see that commission errors were nine. Average for this age is three. So it's almost two and a half, three times as many errors. So that would suggest that here's a youngster who is marking many more items than typically seen with eight-year-olds possibly suggesting impulse control. So that maybe go with the ADHD component or dysregulation of some sort, or maybe even anxiety because this is the first subtest. But whatever the cause, we're finding many items uh, that uh, were that have been marked that have not been moved, added, or changed. We might want to go back and actually look at the protocols to see of those nine, how many are, if you will, um, um, all over the board or whether they come in the first one or two of the pictures or just, just what the deal is there. But certainly uh, it, it's likely that th there is a bit of an exaggeration in skill level because of the and style. Because we, don't, we don't penalize for extra right. things being crossed out. You can end up having, you know, uh, a lot, the more the more responses you make, the more chance you have of, of getting a good score. So this may right. be, as you said, a bit inflated as a result. Right. Another drill down uh, are the design and verbal learning subtests, and uh, we provide grids for those, like we did with with Ramel two. Uh, and these grids are, for those of you for, the, for whom this is new, uh, these are really great to use when working with the briefing sessions with uh, teachers or with uh, clients or sometimes with clients themselves. Um, and here, looking at the pattern, it's kind of interesting that both for the visual as well as the verbal, they, the child here starts relatively inefficiently, but jumps up here in both visual and verbal uh, to be somewhat above average so that overall it's an average performance. Um, and from if this, if this is accurate, what we would expect with working with tutors, for example, to report is that the child is relatively below average at first, but then review seems to have a particular uh, benefit for this youngster. And so we would, probably see that uh, a, a, a more tutoring or extra work probably would be beneficial to this youngster when it comes to visual. And it, what he learns is uh, retained too. So it, it seems to have a beneficial effect. Also, originally, I rather a few minutes ago, I talked about the importance of executive functioning for this child. The only way you can actually be able to, to do better than seven plus or minus two by the time you get 
to trials three and four is if you've developed some sort of a strategy so that it's not just rote rehearsal, but somehow you're connecting things together and you've created a system to uh, do better than just rote memory. And that is being shown here. Uh, that again, like with working memory, um, there is reason to believe that this is a child who has reasonable executive function and so should be certainly part, if you will, of the problem solving team uh, in uh, working out solutions or at least trying to develop solutions uh, that this is a youngster whose input um, is, is probably worth uh, relying on to some degree to know what works and what doesn't work because he's got good skills. What might work better for you, John? That may be the question to ask him. Uh, this is, a, as I said, a similar learning profile, except, of course, we have real problems in retrieving uh, after delay. These are uh, graphs based on uh, the immediate memory. Uh, and these are, of course, the delayed. And so with delay, we're having quite a bit of, of uh, inefficiency being shown there in terms of recall. Uh, one thing I did want to look at uh, here real quickly with the design learning subtest, which, as you know, if you're given RAML 3, it, it has been redesigned. So it is somewhat like um, a uh, uh, array visual learning task in which the child is asked to look at and then to replicate over trials. And so essentially, it's a visual parallel to uh, the verbal learning task. And as part of that, one of the things that we find uh, as a, a drill down, if you will, a process score are quadrant analyses. And here's the card that this youngster uh, created. And as you can see, it's actually very well done on the left hand side. Most of everything is, has been included. The right hand quadrants, both the upper and lower right hand quadrants, you don't see that. And so if you actually look at the quadrant analyses, uh, it's relatively rare to have this little amount of information in those right, and uh, right upper and right lower quadrants compared certainly to the left quadrants. So I'm not sure whether that's just inefficient gazing. And so here's a youngster who doesn't actually explore everything that's in front of them, which might be an interesting thing to experiment with and see if that improves uh, reading or uh, looking at a page even more efficiently, but also uh, would suggest that uh, considering a visual neglect or possibly uh, a, a visual field cut, uh, probably unlikely, but it certainly raises the specter that is that uh, what we're looking at here? Why isn't this youngster performing better uh, on the right hand side. Uh, and we could go back to the picture memory subtests and look at those as well and see whether right hand side tends to be less well achieved than left hand of those cards. Again, watching the youngster learn is probably one of the most helpful things that, that the RAML provides for you. You can, you can watch trial by trial and see if there's a change in, in functioning across time. And it makes you wonder if this is an impulsive young man who gets everything done pretty quickly, because that's certainly one of the pictures, or at least hypotheses, that you're developing. Okay, uh, again, uh, we have story A versus story B analysis. Um, uh, a is a little simpler than B, in both in terms of length and sentence length. Um, and vocabulary, and we have here uh, suggesting that um, the scout score for A, in fact, is significantly uh, stronger than for B, again, being compared to their uh, age group. So there is a, a decrement in performance uh, there, and um, uh, is that linguistically uh, go something going on there, possibly an expressive language uh, problem? Because uh, this youngster has, with the recognition subtest, has the content, but for some reason can't retrieve it or can't express it. But uh, those are certainly hypotheses that seem to be emerging from these results. Here, I mentioned earlier that with verbatim, we have a youngster who 
is performing relatively poorly compared to getting the essence of the story. Uh, and again, possibly attention to detail or again, expressive language might show something like that too. So uh, I think I've gone enough there so we don't uh, monopolize the time. Are there any questions, Ben, that have come in or uh, that want to ask for a few minutes before we move on to the next case? Uh, yeah, we do have three questions. So if someone comes up with something else, they can certainly add it and we will address it as they come. Um, so first we have from someone, I have always hypothesized that attention and concentration, according to the Luria model, impacts working memory. How do you reconcile working memory index for ADHD not correlating with attention and concentration? Well, it does correlate with attention concentration. And if you look at the, the technical manual, there's a pretty high correlation between uh, working memory tasks and uh, the ACI. Um, the, the ACI, though, does not have much of a, or any of a uh, executive function component there. So um, I, I think that I would look at the working memory subtest as requiring the stuff, if you will, of ACI plus much more executive functioning in order to perform those tasks. Dave, you have any insight there? Sorry, I was mute. Uh, I would, I would, I would just add this one thing, and and that is the working memory subtest. One has to hold the ACI type information in the memory buffer while operating on that information. And that, that turns it into a, uh, a very different kind of task. So, you know, while there's some correlation, uh, I, I'm not even sure if, one, if it would be reasonable to expect a, uh, an extremely high correlation. They're not identical tasks. No, the point, point threes to point fours, but um, uh, again, those are reasonably high for tasks that are really ostensibly quite dissimilar. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next one that comes in, could it be argued that the 88 for verbal immediate memory index score is still within normal limits and is therefore a relative weakness, but not necessarily a deficit. Read it again, Ben. Of course. Very exciting um, for short-term memory. <laughs> <laughs> so they, this case scored an 88 for the verbal immediate memory index score. Um, and they're saying, could it be argued that this is a relative weakness, but not necessarily a deficit compared to the other scores? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess it depends on, on who, who, with whom you're comparing the 88. If you're comparing it with the child, the child is probably experiencing it as a deficit. If you're you know, comparing it to uh, an average class, is this child going to stand out? Probably not, based on that one score by themselves. But um, you know, as kids get older, they become very aware of what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are and tend to gravitate towards the strengths and try to avoid the weaknesses. So um, to, you know, uh, avoiding verbal memory weaknesses is not really an option in our world. So uh, identifying it and possibly helping a child developing better coping mechanisms, something as simple as, could you tell me that again, <laughs> that I amply demonstrated a moment ago, uh, uh, is a simple intervention, but, you know, does the child use that? Uh, in social interactions, um, did he understand all that his friend said or did he miss something or a, a direction that a teacher gave? So again, um, it, it's not a, a major deficit, but compared to those relative strengths that we're finding in the other areas, the child probably perceives it as a deficit and therefore uh, may have importance based on that alone. And there's, there's never one score that that sort of jumps out and, and makes you think fine or, or not fine. We're, we're looking at an overall pattern of performance and the, the, uh, the, the quote 88 that, that was initially referred to uh, as you're beginning to scan the data. Now, as you're looking through the rest of the, the IR, you're beginning to see a pattern of some verbal linguistic sequencing difficulties that might, that might give you some support 
uh, for understanding that there may be more than just ADHD here. They may also be uh, support for, for looking at a reading disability with other test material that you might do for your assessment. Yeah, and if you, again, so, uh, I, I, again, would not dismiss the ADA because if you look at the delayed verbal, it drops even further into really an impaired range. So um, the ADA to actually, in my mind, um, is uh, uh, an overestimate of really the production in verbal memory um, from this child. When you look at that delay score, it, it, it becomes more, more attention getting for me as a clinician. Excellent, thank you. We've got uh, quite a few coming in now. Um, I'm wondering about the reasons why sound symbol was excluded from the Ramble 3. Um, this person didn't use it often, but they thought it provided helpful information about the child's ability to learn sound symbol associations. David, I'll give that one to you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I really liked it as well. Uh, many of you who have used the Ramel 3 will notice that there's a significant time investment that one, one might make to, to give the Ramel. And we had to make some choices about what to include and what to leave out in terms of information per unit time. And because it just, I mean, I loved it, but it wasn't used frequently enough despite those cases where I thought it was a wonderful demonstration, but it wasn't used frequently enough. And we, we use the time, hopefully, for some better purpose. Uh, the, and the, uh, I guess the other justification, too, is uh, we, we, we didn't think that sound symbol actually measured uh, visual working memory as well as, as the verbal uh, working memory task from, uh, you know, looking at how working and how working memory is defined generally speaking sound symbol um, um, well it didn't didn't fit the, the theoretical picture as well whereas the, the new visual working memory task does uh, and because of its composition that is its format it becomes a an easy uh, subtest and to compare uh, visual and verbal uh, working memory because they are highly similar tasks, but uh, each looks at, you know, as the name suggests, a greater emphasis on verbal skills and the other uh, emphasizes the visual skills in working memory. So uh, because it, it, it's a better package, if you will, uh, as they said, something had to get dropped and so sound symbol did. Uh, some people also were favoring uh, less symbolic material because for kids with you know symbol manipulation problems it, it created weakness possibly where there wasn't weakness if we were to stay away from symbols and measuring visual working memory so that, that was another justification appreciate it all right moving on to design learning for a couple of questions here uh, first off is what recommend or what would recommendations be for a child who neglects part of the grid on design learning? Well, first we'd probably want to look at some of his schoolwork to make sure that what the test is finding is in fact uh, what the teacher and the parents are finding uh, this child doing in the real world. If in fact that gets replicated, then um, uh, there's a reasonable body of literature working with people with visual neglects so of how to train to, to compensate uh, looking to that uh, right visual field. I'm not gonna go into them now, but uh, simply uh, having them uh, put their finger at the right-hand side of the page to let them know where the end of the page is and to teach them to continue to look for that finger uh, as a way of letting them know where the boundaries are. But there are a bunch of, of skills like that, which are fairly straightforward um, and help the person eventually learn to simply turn their head rather than their visual gaze uh, to compensate uh, for neglect. The, the, the possibility of visual neglect and field cut in an eight-year-old is pretty slim, but it's possible. And since we did find that, it probably needs to be followed up on. But I'd be surprised if actually there was a neglect there. I, I'm thinking Dave's suggestion of a youngster who may be just a bit impulsive and wants to get on to the next task 
may hold more weight. But, but again, and, and, and maybe here's here's a very simple one. If if this is a youngster who's who, who's rushing and doesn't space things out, if you take a a pad like this and you turn it this way, you now have spacing that's easily available to the youngster so that you're able to use the space on the page instead of crowding everything in, particularly if you're, if you're an impulsive youngster who's just rushing to get your work done. So again, we're talking about an organizational or an executive uh, strategy that might help the youngster. Excellent, I appreciate it. All right, on to our next um, design learning question about quadrants. A uh, person recently had a top right quadrant that was largely empty, empty, excuse me, a base rate of less than 2%. So they thought of potential visual neglect. They looked at the picture memory and wondered if you thought of making a two by two graphic overlay to examine the same inattention neglect um, for visual information. Well, we did. Go ahead, David. You, you uh, they did. We did, but we thought, how much more can we ask of people? We are, we are trying to squeeze as much data as we possibly can. And, and you know, if, if your goal is to develop hypotheses and that you know, as you watch people work, you know, watching, watching people work that have, that have visual neglect is an excellent way of thinking about their visual neglect. You know, the youngster who doesn't see dessert on the right-hand side of the tray because he's complaining that he didn't get any dessert might actually be the kind of person you're thinking of with visual neglect. It's a rare event for most, most school children. Yeah, for those of you who work with uh, head injured youngsters, however, it's much more common, especially uh, early on in recovery. Appreciate it. All right, we're transitioning on to working memory index for the next few questions. I'm um, gonna start it off. Uh, conceptually speaking, what is the difference between WISC-5's working memory index and the RAML-3's working memory index? If you could elaborate on that at all. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to do comparisons with the competition. I'm sure that it's a wonderful subtest that does <laughs> measure working memory. But you know, I I rarely give the Wexler for obvious reasons, so I don't really feel that I should talk about it. Yeah, we have we have some experts in the uh, audience. Lisa, uh, are you uh, Lisa Drosnik, Are you out there? Or Jen, um, would you like to chime in on that uh, comparison with WISC a working memory? Uh, no, okay. <laughs> and that's fine. We can move on to another one and, and we can follow up with that question uh, after the presentation. Now, I um, mean, the, the first thing is that yeah, there isn't really a visual working memory component uh, for WISC. Um, and it's heavily dominated by uh, digits forwards and backwards. And I think one could argue whether digits forwards actually is a working memory uh, element or not. So I mean, those are just some quick thoughts from my head. I don't, I don't know if this will be interesting, but in terms of the development of the visual work and memory subtest, there were at least 24 iterations of the subtest that were tried before we found something that was really a workable subtest for visual working memory. And then we brought it to the, the special design team that Pearson has to help us, uh, to help us find a way to presenting it uh, to to our you know to our examinees in a way that would be both interesting and fun, so it's it's it wasn't it it in our minds it is one of the truest visual working memory subtests, uh, and and we thought it was a, a great uh, analogous companion to the verbal working memory subtest. So I don't I don't know that. All right, I'll say it. I don't know that the the that that Wexler really captured the visual working memory in, in the way that the subtests are constructed. There, I said it. <laughs> well, I appreciate your honesty. Um, <laughs> moving forward, this person was curious if you had any more information to provide about the correlation between working memory and processing speed. 
Um, yeah, I think that, let me check, well, uh, take another question. I will look in the technical manual. There is a, a, a table uh, for Wexler comparison. So I suspect those data are there. Let me take a and, peek. And I wonder if, if maybe we should move on because uh, I don't want to hold anybody over too long while Wayne is looking. Uh, I can introduce the next patient and then Wayne can just clarify that point. Um, I can tell you real, real quickly, somewhere between 0.36 and 0.49 the processing speed and either visual or verbal working memory. And those are relatively uh, high um, correlations um, among subtests, although finger windows, interestingly, um, is up there too. Excellent, we'll move on then. Uh, would it be correct to assume that working memory requires appropriate retrieval and temporary storage capacity of information? Yes, absolutely. And a few more things too. <laughs> All right, and they continue on, and fluid reasoning problem solving skills in order to be successful. Whereas the ACI looks more at narrowly at how a person attends to and simply responds to stimulus. I think, I think it's, it's, and it's, it's road in a different kind of information too. It's road information. Uh, simply say, you know, reiterate what I've just said or shown. Uh, there is not really uh, processing like with fluid reasoning going on. I mean, it's it's pretty much a road information in and information out without a whole lot of higher cognitive activity. All right, moving on. If there is a large split between index scores, are you advising that we do not report the general memory index score? It's an interesting debate uh, because sometimes it, you know, in in the in the IR, you will be cautioned about about whether the general memory scores are really representative of quote general memory. Uh, and does lead you to move down to interpreting the index scores. But there's another camp that does suggest that the general memory scores are really helpful in understanding, you know, sort of the way that the patient generally presents. And, um, you know, in our thinking, we've gone back and forth on this. I tend not to uh, look at a general memory score when there are significant discrepancies. Yeah, and I would probably also add that you know, the second camp tends to uh, make the case, and it's correct, that those general index scores have the highest reliability. So why would you then use a score, even though it might be interesting, but it has low reliability, lower reliability? So, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable argument, but I guess I, I jump ship on that, uh, the greater the discrepancy becomes, because, you know, what you're, what you're going to be reporting is, say, a, a 90 on a youngster who has 115 and an 80 uh, combo, uh, and to say, here we have a youngster who's more or less in the average range, doesn't capture his strength and doesn't capture his weakness, uh, and so does the child a disservice particularly for people who just look at the index scores, oh, he's average and moves on. Um, so I guess it depends on the audience and the degree of discrepancy uh, before I would not report the, um, the uh, index score, the general index score. Excellent. So I have one more before I think we should move on to the second case. Um, and if there were some that didn't get to, uh, we will address them at the end. Um, can you identify visual perceptual disorders from this instrument or nonverbal learning disability? Or any recommendations? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but I would. <laughs> That's I would a loaded know. question because <laughs> there's a, certainly a group of, of highly prominent people who would even debate whether there was such a thing as a nonverbal learning disability. Uh, I suppose if you believe in, in such a thing, um, then sure, I mean, it's going to get captured here. Uh, now, just how it's going to manifest itself um, is, is, I guess, the question that's be really being asked. And, and in response to that question, I wouldn't, I, I, would, I would have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I have diagnosed youngsters with nonverbal learning disability and have used some of the data as support for that. 
uh, for that, it's not actually a DSM diagnosis, but for that diagnosis. But you need, you need more than, I think you need more than the RAML for that. I think you really need a good bit of supporting evidence. Although I don't know that Byron Rourke would need a whole lot more supporting evidence since uh, you know, he wrote several books uh, detailing nonverbal learning disabilities. It's not, in our area, it doesn't seem to be as common a diagnosis as it used to be. So you, you know, diagnoses often have sociological phenomena attached to them. It doesn't seem to be as, as commonly accepted as it used to be. Excellent. I appreciate everyone for submitting these questions. Um, I think we're going to move on to the second case here, so we have time to get that in. And then the remaining time, we will address uh, any new questions that came in or the, or the few we weren't able to get to. So, and then share. Here we go. So, I'm um, I'm going to present the the second case. Um, are you hearing me okay, Wayne? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Doing okay. fine. Okay, so uh, the second case is an 86-year-old male uh, who was referred by his physician uh, with a, a diagnosis of early Alzheimer's, but it seems that, that the world is getting a little bit more difficult for this patient, and we're going to call him Pat. Uh, recently, procedures that were demonstrated to Pat have not, well been, have not been learned well, and it doesn't, they don't seem to be remembered. He was even... Uh, he even got lost in the neighborhood, uh, and there's some frustration reported in his caretakers. Uh, I know a number of uh, you who are listening uh, don't work with adults, so I, I just wanted you to to uh, I just wanted to emphasize that the the. Uh, analysis that we're using for this case may also be useful for youngsters that you've seen with uh, neurological difficulties, with eye, uh, intellectual impairment, and perhaps even with autism. So what I would like to do is demonstrate how I might use the IR uh, with, with a patient that has this progressive neurological disorder. Uh, the first thing that I tend to do is look at the performance validity indicator. Wayne talked about that uh, initially. Uh, and in Pat's situation, you can <clears throat> see the validity indicator is now indeterminate. And you, you will be cautioned uh, about, about the effort or the motivation put in by, by Pat. Uh, but I also want to note that with, with performances that are really, uh, that are really poor, uh, as in the, the recognition scores that Pat earned, the, the performance validity indicator is probably more consistent with his diagnosis than is consistent with, uh, with uh, poor effort or even suggestion of malingering. Yeah, and you'll find that too with, with uh, folks with the intellectual delay, moderate, or even mild level. Um, so you have to be a little cautious on using that performance validity indicator when you're working with exceptional, or potential for exceptional and low performance. Yeah. So, you know, when I, when I use the, the IR, uh, I'm thinking of, of a couple of things. One of the things that I'm thinking is the hypotheses that I might have developed while working with the patient. Uh, I would like to see support for that in the data. And I would like to see if I can uh, alter the hypotheses, add to them, or uh, color the hypotheses. The IR is particularly helpful uh, for, for this purpose because there, there can be so much data uh, developed from the RAML3 that time scoring can be really efficiently used better for time anal analyzed for time for analysis. So as I'm looking down as uh, the, the index score summary, I look first at the general immediate memory. As Wayne mentioned, it's probably the most reliable 
among the most reliable of scores. And I see the general immediate memory index is functioning in kind of the low range. But when I look at the visual, verbal, and attention concentration indexes, I'm seeing a marked discrepancy between scores that compose the general immediate memory index. And here, I don't think I would, you know, in answer to the question before, I don't think I would employ the general memory index as an overall measure of immediate memory ability. And in fact, uh, that, that gets strengthened when you look at the general delay and the general recognition indexes, uh, the performances there drop down below the first percentile. And with a, uh, a, a patient presenting with, with a neurological disorder, the, the delay indices might be better uh, descriptor of overall memory ability. You know, one of the things that Ben mentioned before is we put greater emphasis on the role of delay memory as a measure of, quote, memory, because when this patient walks away from a learning episode, the information that that, that patient walks away with is probably what the general population would consider to be memory. The second thing that I like to do is get a different view of, uh, of the data. And as, as Wayne mentioned before, by looking at the graph of, of the data on the right-hand side, there's the index scores on the left-hand side. Uh, there's, whoops, whoops, whoops. On the left-hand side, there are subtest scores. Can I, can you, can I get the, uh, the, uh, the indicator up? To You're talking about the pointer? The pointer, I'm sorry, not the indicator. Yeah, I'll uh, go down to the left. Can you see all those symbols? Yep, mm -hmm. click on the little highlighter right, pen. Use your, just use your cursor. It, it just, cursor? Okay, yeah. all right. So it, again, if we're looking at the data from a graphic presentation, uh, it's probably the most powerful way of sharing in a reporting conference with parents and, and, and examinee uh, how, how the, uh, the data from the actual testing it may be able to be interpolated to the real world. So again, we see most unusually the attention concentration subtest clustered in the average range. It's pretty remarkable, but nevertheless, that's, that's the data. But when we look down here now to general immediate memory, if we follow it down in a time delay, down to general delay and general recognition, we're, we're watching the degradation of, of the memory over time. And that's a very powerful demonstration and probably one that the people attending the reporting conference know very well. And if you wanted to emphasize that, in each of the individual subtests, or that we've, we have the data collated here into family of subtests. So again, the immediate picture memory, delay, and recognition. Uh, Dave, let me just chime in there too. The, those uh, higher ACI scores, um, I mean, in one sense, it's good that there's strength there. But on the other hand, there is the potential for uh, expectations that uh, are much higher than the long-term memory capabilities of this person uh, actually can demonstrate. So, you know, uh, you know Pat, uh, you know, what did I just tell you? And Pat might be able to tell you a reasonable amount of that you know, five seconds after you just told him. But 20 minutes later, it's just not there. And, uh, and, and so if you, if you learn to expect or you establish your expectations based upon the short-term memory performance, uh, you might have a very different level of expectation than if you look at the delay performance. And we're certainly gonna, gonna uh, take a look at that. You know, it was also mentioned before that the, the IR is a top-down analysis. So we went from, you know, the, the, the global index scores 
down to subtest scores, down to process scores. And we're certainly gonna be talking about that as we go along. So in fact, if we're now looking at the, the, uh, the subtest scores, if you're looking at the nonverbal, at the nonverbal subtest and the verbal subtest, you, you may be apt to, to, to focus on the difference between, the, between these subtests. But if you're if you are if you are if you if you go down to the general recall subtests, one of the things that you can see here is that three out of the four general recall subtests have raw scores of zero, and that's particularly uh, revealing and maybe particularly disturbing. That over time no information gets recalled from the initial presentation. I'm gonna call your attention to this because I, I, some people wonder, is this an error in the testing? But it's really not. My colleague calls these scores the corp score. If you, if you show up, you will end up with scale scores uh, of three or four. Uh, I just want you to know, you, you can't, you, whoa, whoop, whoop, sorry, you can't get, uh, you can't put on enough easy items at the age of, for the age of 86 to be able to get a really good floor. By the time you would have taken all of those items, your patient would have fallen asleep or you would have. So again, the trend is correct. And you have to not only look at subtest scores with, with mm, sorry, not only look at subtest scores, but you also have to look at raw data when you, when you have patients at the extremes of the scale and with significant impairment. I'm gonna show you a very different graph. Wayne, Wayne showed you the, the process score. So again, the process score is the score that, that helps flesh out how did the, your, your examinee do what he or she did during the subtest. And so, we're going to take a look at the, the, the typical learning curve for an 86-year-old for design learning. Now, for those of you who are just beginning to use the RAML 3, we went from a design memory, which used four different designs over trials, to, uh, to a design learning, the same complex design repeated over trials to make it more analogous to the verbal learning subtest. So again, the, 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 uh, the IR is really helpful in pointing out in uh, the normative learning curve. And also the white down here is Pat's learning curve. And you can see a very different kind of performance than what Wayne showed you with his youngster with ADHD and maybe reading. Here, Pat, showed very limited learning over trials. And again, with a 20 minute delay, there was no savings, suggesting that uh, maybe what, what uh, his caretakers are already know, that if you remind him and you remind him and you prompt him and you cue him, you're probably not getting a whole lot of savings of learning over time. And because at times, uh, neurological disorders like Alzheimer's uh, can, can be spotty, you might wonder, is there consistency in, in, in verbal and visual areas? And again, you can see there's a similar kind of curve uh, for the verbal learning subtest as there is for the design, design learning subtest. And that is when you have a design, when you have the delay trial, you get no learning that's saved over time. Very dramatic. And I think during a reporting conference, this is going to be one of the more powerful things you can share with the group. Here's, here's a, an, as, you, as you move down the, the IR, you, you, you'll find tables that- I, For the, and some people, IR is the interpreter report. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, so as you're going down the interpretive report, uh, you'll find tables that, that look at comparisons uh, be between, between some of the data that's been uh, gathered. 
And the uh, one that I just wanted to call attention to because of, of the, uh, the presenting problem is the delay recall and, and recognition comparisons. So you can see in the scale score uh, in the first column is the delay. In the second column, there's recognition. And one of the things that is here is that there are no significant differences between the delayed and recognition. And when, when I saw that with Pat, it made me a little sad. You know, we, we know that the recognition memory system is a really robust system. It, it, it is, uh, you know, when we can't remember the name, oh, what's the name of that, that movie star? And then when we look at them, we go, oh yeah, I know who that is. I've seen them in this other movie. So the recognition system is, is, is when, we, when I was uh, seeing that there were no differences between recall and recognition, I thought, boy, prompting Pat is not going to be terribly helpful. In, in, in helping him recall any of the information said to him a while ago. And as we continue to move down uh, the, uh, the interpretive report, there are both working memory uh, and sentence memory subtests. Those are supplementary uh, subtests that we, you know, we, we like to administer because they, it gives you a whole different idea. In fact, one of the things that Wayne mentioned before is if you look at the subtest scores for finger windows and number letter, again, quite average, quite surprising. But now, as we're beginning to add executive function to, to the, the, uh, the memory needs, so re recall again that working memory is the ability to hold information in that memory buffer operate on it for a later recall. I think whoever asked the question before provided a great definition of the skills needed. You're gonna see quite a drop in performance between the immediate or quote echoic memory and the working memory. And, and even more than that, if as you look at the raw score, which again, I, I always like to look at the raw score and see what, what how many items the patient was able to was able to, uh, to master. And again, here, there weren't very many items that, that Pat was able to uh, get correct. And the, those early, th those whoop, 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 sorry, though I have a very sensitive trackpad. Uh, those early uh, items are probably mm, maybe the foundation of working memory and don't really, uh, don't really emphasize heavy working memories. Mostly intended as training items, actually. Yeah. They were, but, you know, again, we wanted to make sure that everybody was going to be able to do the working memory items well. And so, uh, again, it's, it's just a swell idea, in addition to just looking at scale scores, to look at how did the patient do what the patient did. The last, uh, the last supplementary subtest that I wanted to mention, uh, again, was sentence memory. Again, a pretty respectable score. But when you're looking at a small amount of information to be recalled compared to a large amount of information to be recorded, like story memory, we're seeing a significant change in performance. And again, over time, you're seeing the same pattern that Pat has demonstrated, and that is uh, very limited savings of, of memory over time. You know, a, a, story, a story memory delayed raw score of zero. The last thing that I wanted to mention, because I wanted to save a couple of minutes for questions, is at the end of the IR, you will have read anywhere between 25 and 28 pages of narrative and charts. And Wayne and I thought it would be a swell idea to provide a summary of some of the important data that you, that you uh, reviewed. Uh, and with that idea in mind, with, a, with that idea, oops, with that idea in mind, uh, there are 10 important findings in, in Pat's report. And I'm just gonna just point out that here, if we'll, we'll just pick out one for the, the sake of time. So we have, which we mentioned before, the general memory in column one, the delayed memory in column two, 
And then we look at the base rate in the last column. So we all know that we can have statistically significant information. We can have statistically significant differences, but it may not be all that important. So statistically, you might find a difference that happens you know, 25% of the time, which is interesting, but maybe not that important. But here, uh, we use two measures, both, both statistically significant and clinically significant. And that's where, the word, that's where the base rate column comes in. So again, if you're looking at the, the general immediate memory versus delayed, that happens only 2% of the time. That's probably something you want to include in your report. It's a pretty good reminder of, uh, of uh, what, what might be uh, worth, worth uh, lifting and copying. And I understand, I understand that we can, if it's a Word document, you can copy and lift both the, uh, both the charts and uh, some of the narrative to include in your report, which, you know, take it and make it your own. So again, those were the important summary findings. And I wanted to go through that quickly to save a little bit of time for questions. Well, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, to start us off, this person states, they had concern for using recognition scores. Um, and that it seems that they'd be skewed by part of the norming sample who did well on immediate recall. So uh, for example, if you remembered it during immediate recall, you're very likely to answer the recognition question correctly. Uh, was there any consideration given to this for the interpretation of recognition scores? Yeah, I, would, I would disagree with the premise. Um, as they just demonstrated, you had a, a person who did reasonably well, at least with uh, ACI types of immediate memory, but by the time they got to recognition, uh, it was gone. So uh, uh, immediate memory or delayed memory is not necessarily a good estimate of recognition. I, I would back up and say, if the immediate and delayed scores both are average, is it worth then giving recognition I'd probably say if you're in a time crunch, probably not. If they were able to uh, spontaneously give you what is required with delay, there's probably a 99% chance that they're going to give it to you in recognition as well, which is a, a, a more robust uh, memory system, as Dave said. Um, so um, I, I, I wouldn't say the same, though, with the media. And I, I, uh, I'd like to maybe just emphasize that. I don't know if I would use the time to give recognition if, if, if the delay scores were really high. I don't think you're going to find much of a decrement there. But I also wanted to mention that from the RAML 2 to the RAML 3, the RAML 2 was a yes, no kind of, a, there was like a two choice system here, yes, no. And um, that wasn't as satisfactory as we had hoped. So for the recognition subtest, uh, we now had three choices and a none. So now there are four choices and, and it's not basically, so, so there are four choices and uh, it's not a forced choice between A, B and C because now you have a none. So it actually, it actually provided better data than the recognition subtest for, uh, for the RAML 2. Yeah, uh, chance plays much less of a, of a role than it did with Ramel 2. Excellent, thank you. Um, regarding cognitive stamina, are scores influenced by their place in the queue or order? Unknown, because that's the way it was standardized. <laughs> um, in, in a sense, there's sort of an indirect um, estimate of that. The uh, attention concentration index comes about, you know, at the end of, uh, of uh, the immediate, which is about halfway through if you're going to give the whole ramble. The recognitions come, uh, you, know, uh, you know, later, maybe 10, 15 minutes later. So you can kind of get an estimate of how much fatigue is starting to affect things by comparing the ACI and, and you know, and the uh, recognition components. Um, I would certainly say that 
if you're giving you know a typical battery of an intelligence measure and a you know a screening of other kinds of things and a memory measure, uh, if, if your client is in fatigue, the, the clinician is. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, when you when you're suspecting uh, fatigue going on, obviously you have choices of you know, do you want to extend it to another day, or do you want to do a brief screening. We haven't talked about the brief yet, but uh, that is an option uh, that was developed here for RAML3. It's a two subtest option. Uh, it's discussed at some length in the uh, technical manual and the administration manual, but it takes the, the uh, two subtests that have the highest reliability, stories and designs, uh, and allows you in roughly 11 minutes uh, depending on age and competence and other in your experience in administering it, uh, about 11 minutes to uh, um, uh, get a reasonable amount of, of really good information and allow you to determine is it really worth you know giving a more extensive memory test? We've screened visual, we've screened verbal. If they're doing pretty well with those two, um, maybe that's enough given the fatigue factor that is certainly they're banging at the door for any kind of assessment, particularly if you've preceded a memory assessment with intellectual and academic assessment. And if you've done ACI type data collection from another source, uh, you can use the screening memory form, which is four subtests. Uh, you know, we, we try to be respectful of the user's time to uh, allow the most flexible administration of the RAML while giving you the most data that basically you have time for. You know, if, if we're, you know, I just wanted to mention one more thing because uh, the, the neuropsychological assessment of memory is certainly one really important measure of memory. Well, the everyday memory, I know this is gonna sound like a sale, but I hope, I hope it's not because I think it's important that the everyday memory assessment uh, doesn't always correlate with neuropsychological assessment of memory that well. And so because of that, we, uh, we developed a, uh, another, another assessment procedure called the Everyday Memory Scale that looks at, dare I say it, everyday memory functioning. And we have found that if you're going to make the best recommendations for your patients, and again, these are for older patients, uh, a measure of everyday functional memory or deficits, plus a measure of neuropsychological memory ability or deficit is probably the best way to make recommendations for your patients. I hope, I hope you don't mind me just saying that because I, I, I have learned that that's probably the best thing that you can do. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a big fan of the everyday memory survey myself, so uh, I'm fine with the plug. Um, we do have some, a few more questions that might take us a few minutes over time. I just wanna let anyone know if you have any more questions coming in, uh, you might wanna include your email address so we can reach out to you afterwards with the answer or the form at the end, you can also fill out and we'll reach out to you from there. So we will try to get to as many as we can before time expires. Uh, the next one up, um, it's kind of similar to one we had earlier with the indexes about the general immediate memory, but this has to do with subtests. When there is a large range between subtests, would the index score be interpretable? Um, I'm assuming kind of the same answer you had before, but if there's anything you're, else you want to elaborate. You're probably in the same, in the same predicament, and that is, uh, you know, if you look at the IR, the IR will absolutely caution you not not to use the index score, uh, to, not to use the index score, uh, <clears throat> because you probably are looking for areas of strength and weakness within, you know, within that particular area. However, there are times where that may be representative, and so you you know you're going to have to you're going to have to look at uh, information patterns across across more subtests maybe even then the ramble. Yeah, and Sorry. I can also add that um, uh, if there's wide variability across subtests, <clears throat> I think trying to eliminate the variability <laughs> by giving the, the index scores 
does a dis can do a disservice to the client. I mean, it's sort of the maybe sometimes we miss the obvious. If there's wide variability across all these subtests, uh, then maybe this is a, a client whose internal computer does things in a variable way that we have an unpredictable information processing system going on here and uh, almost demands that we look more closely and realize that this is going to be a more complex youngster than many of his or adult than many of his peers. And sometimes that just knowing that, that here we have a complex youngster uh, given the variability uh, that can be um, a, a message that is um, comforting to parents or teachers who are frustrated. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and, and it doesn't seem to work. And maybe we can say, well, we see why it maybe isn't working because of the much greater variability in this youngster across individual tests than we would expect in 90% of the standardization sample. And if you're if you're looking for a more psychometric response to that, that would be a great place to look at the process scores, because the if you're getting variability, it's really incumbent upon you to ask what's that variability about. If if you if you're able to uncover that, and sometimes the way that the that your examinee did what he or she did is going to be helpful in developing hypotheses as to what that variability is about. And again, with, with variability, um, my students have, have heard this ad nauseum, but uh, once you have that degree of variability that the person writing this question has described, uh, it almost is uh, required that in the recommendations, whatever you're recommending, you put down, this needs to be tried for X number of weeks, probably two or three weeks as a mini experiment, and then at the end of that time, we need to take stock of how successful it was achieving whatever goal we have made the recommendation for. So often, you know, the recommendation that we find in the report is taken by teachers or parents as this is what we're going to do. And then it never changes. <laughs> it's, it's like the medication recommendation for ADHD. Uh, how long he's been in four different offices for five different testings and the medication has not changed. And why not? I mean, why is he being given the medication? So, um, uh, the idea of examining our recommendations and actually explicitly stating in the report, especially of those that show wide variability, to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of whatever intervention has been recommended uh, at some point in time and then have a course correction that has been planned. Having that in an IEP, particularly for a hard to program for a student is a really important element. Excellent. We'll try to get to these last few ones here pretty quickly. I think this is one everyone can kind of relate to. Um, the technology and use of cell phones have impacted working memory in many ways. Uh, this person illustrates an example that back in the day we used to memorize phone numbers and cell phone numbers um, and can still recall them. But nowadays, uh, I couldn't even name my own half the time. Um, would you be able to uh, speak about this in any way about about the evolution of working memory? Well, my, my reaction is, yeah, you may not remember, be required to remember your phone number, but you do have to remember how to how to use the app that you put in as the surrogate for your short-term memory. And that has memory, sometimes greater memory demands than, you know, rote memory. So uh, I, I think there's still memory demands being made. In fact, probably even more so, and, and probably more along the line of working memory, because what we are, what is important to remember now is how to access information, which sometimes is more complex than the information itself. <laughs> and again, I think the more the more that you the more that you think about the executive functioning that you need to be able to employ to improve uh, memory function uh, over just you know just echoic memory. Uh, I I don't I don't know if that's going to change drastically with the use of technology. We still have to employ the strategies needed to be able to remember. <laughs> and you're bringing a lot of those strategies uh, to the task. 
And the strategies that you're bringing to the task are going to be the ones that are going to facilitate organization and, and uh, uh, hierarchical thinking, and that will facilitate memory. Excellent. Uh, a couple more here, and then I think that's about as far over as we can go. Um, can you speak to how the RAML 3 might be used in identifying learning disabilities or possibly in any meetings that the school might have about potential learning disabilities or special needs uh, programs that are needed? I hope that case one was illustrative of how RAML 3 can at least generate hypotheses. Uh, that first slide, I think, should be a, should be a you know, a, a, a wake up call uh, for us to be looking for memory difficulties in children who demonstrate reading problems or in um, it, to some degree attention deficit, but particularly reading problems or, or other kinds of learning difficulties. There is a high probability that there will be memory deficits somewhere along the line. Um, so I would think some kind of uh, of assessment of whether these do exist and then to come up with a number of memory strategies or uh, adjuncts that would be useful for youngsters. So maybe they don't remember their times table, but you know, using a calculator might not be a bad idea. So, I mean, just a lot of, of uh, different ways of attacking a memory difficulty or inefficiency once it's been identified. I'll add, I'll add one more one more thing to what Wayne said. Many of the uh, many of the subtests that are used as part of a standard assessment uh, look at information that's already been learned. One of the the things that I've appreciated most from the Ramel, and particularly the Ramel three, is you get the opportunity to watch your your examinee learn right in front of you. You're giving them information. You're saying, show me how you learn this task and show me how you retain the information from the task that, that you were just asked to learn. And as a psychologist, uh, we don't get a chance to do that as often in the classroom as of course teachers do. So you have some very powerful uh, hypotheses that you can develop by the way that the examinee retains the information, and then you have the, the data to support those hypotheses to say that, that you know, there's a significant deficit here, and you can demonstrate that psychometrically. I, I don't think, I might be a little biased here, I don't think there's another test that is going to be more helpful in an IEP session or, or in a reporting conference then if you, if you really integrate the observations, the reason for referral and the data from, a, from the test. Excellent. It seems both of you are looking into the future. We just got a comment, someone stating that they can't agree more that observing the process of learning is a valuable opportunity. And then he prays on the ramble. Um, but another couple quick questions, if we could get a couple quick answers. Um, going back to your first slide, the bar graphs, as you mentioned, Wayne, in a little bit, um, the average index scores for reading disorder were around 90. They were wondering if perhaps they should be thinking about scores at 90 as an indication of a, of a problem or maybe a future problem. Well, it's an inefficiency. Uh, again, this is a wide swath. Um, and you know, you're talking two standards, two thirds of a standard deviation below average. So yet 90, I mean, for some populations that may not stand out, but it is suggestive that if the average is 90, then half the people are below 90. Uh, and for them, it is going to be a problem. Uh, and even for, you know, uh, we don't know, but, you know, here, here's Adam's opinion. We have a number of very capable um, you know, high IQ children who have undiagnosed uh, memory difficulties because they compensate so well. But at some point in time, the, the compensation for a, a, even a mild memory deficit compared to the normal population becomes rather critical for a youngster who is above average in so many things. Uh, and so, get, you know, writing their assignments down accurately so they can get and go home and, and do their assignment accurately and, and not turn the wrong page of homework in. I mean, that, that can be demoralizing, particularly to a bright kid. And, you know, they get teased, so there are social consequences. So 
Um, I, I, I'm, I'm less enthusiastic to say, well, it's 90, that's average, let's go home. I might also add that, uh, you know, I, I would be reluctant to use the RAML as a way of diagnosing a learning disability. Uh, I, I really think you need some additional testing for that. What, what the RAML does is it provides you with a lot of supporting data and allows you to develop the hypotheses of some of the underlying deficits that might be contributing to that learning disability. But as a diagnostic test of learning disability, I think we, you may be overselling if you don't do some additional, um, additional psychometrics to support that. Excellent. And one last question, and then we'll be able to let people go. Um, I apologize to everyone else who didn't have the time to get their answer question, excuse me, question answered. Um, there will be a form at the end you can fill out, or you can reach out to anyone at Pearson. Uh, it will make its way to me, and I'll make sure that either the authors or the research director will be able to answer it. Um, to sign off, um, something I know you've had some discussion about before, um, does anything are there any, excuse me, what does it suggest if recognition scores are significantly below delayed scores? It's a really unusual finding. And it's one that, that, that it, it really gets to be in a level of like eyebrow raising. With the, with the patient, with Pat that I, that I presented, the recognition scores were so poor that it, 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 uh, uh, it, it suggested that the, whatever was retained from the delay scores was even lost more with a very small time delay that went into recognition. And that prompting, cueing, reminding, conjoling, demanding that you remember the information that we want you to remember is really not gonna be helpful. You know, again, yeah. recognition, recognition should, should be, it, it should it's it should be easier to recall information when you're reminded about that information. Yeah, as Dave said, it's an unusual finding. Uh, I actually I think we at one point when we were looking at standardization data just asked that question, and I forget the percentage, but it's you know maybe four percent something like that. Um, and yeah, the things I would often think about would be fatigue. Uh, because, you know, it's coming near the end of the assessment, you have this whole page of things, and I go, ah, yeah. so people who have to get off to their soccer game, in fact, I had one answer that long ago, say, I blew it off because I had to get my soccer game. Uh, so um, there, there are sometimes weird sort of circumstances, uh, and I would think that um, we, we don't really have data showing that ADHD kids or adults uh, have a hard time looking through four options and choosing the right option and then going on to that, even though the page is full of little, little pictures, uh, it doesn't seem to be an attention issue. So I would be thinking about fatigue uh, or some other complicating factor of scheduling near the end that we're unaware of. In fact, we did, we did look at that when we were developing the recognition by adding three items and uh, none of them. Uh, whether that was too many stimuli to look at uh, and, and process accurately. And surprisingly, it, it's not. People tend to like the recognition subtests. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for your time um, and your insight. Uh, like I mentioned, we will try to follow up with every question we weren't able to get to. Uh, if you have anything left to say, uh, say it now, and then, and then we'll close out for the rest of the day. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your attention today. That, that's really very nice of you all to spend your time with us. Yeah, and I think it's great that uh, uh, interactions such as this uh, exist, you know, I thank Pearson for it, uh, because you know, so many of uh, those people watching really care about their kids and, and doing a good job and helping kids. And hopefully this has gone to at least to contribute some degree uh, to that end. So thanks. All right, and with that, we will end the meeting. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.